Hello, my name is Wayne Gilbert. I'm a practitioner of metaphor medicine and parky jazz, AKA a poet. Welcome to this poetry reading, the opening session of our first reimagined poetry metaphor medicine Zoom lab sponsored by the Unsteady Hand for people with Parkinson's and care partners. A word about metaphor medicine first. It is the power of making poems to increase our overall well-being. As people with Parkinson's, we need to explore, examine, and embrace metaphors of some kind in order to tell our stories about our experience with this diagnosis. It's through metaphors that we create and claim meanings. Make it meaningful. Without those meanings and that meaningfulness, our experience is, or can be, unbearable. At the end of this reading, I'll invite you to write your own poem or poems, and you'll have the opportunity to share your writing in small Zoom groups with me, with others, and to talk further about this business of metaphor medicine. But I want to jump right in now and get to the first poem. This is a poem I wrote before the pandemic, but I think it still applies. And I was really talking to people in the world around me who don't seem to appreciate what it takes to be there with them. The poem is called Disappearing Act. I'm disappearing. You probably can't tell unless you're my wife, unless you're my adult children, among my closest friends. I'm not trying to hide it from you. I try to be present as fully, as fully as you. But that's never easy. Some days, I can't. I don't mean to compare my condition to yours. I, I'm not complaining. I would like you to know how deep I have to go. The resources I must access to be out in the world with you right now. Answering questions, making conversation, contributing to some project we share, even reading my poems. I'm not shy. I no longer believe I'm an introvert on overload. I have to work like hell to actually exist, have a measurable, meaningful presence in your world, which doesn't welcome those who seem to hold back as if I'm I'm working some angle from which I hope to profit or win big with the hand I'm holding, take advantage of you. You might think I've something to hide. Perhaps I'm demented. You don't want to feel sad or acknowledge your own inevitable disability affliction. That's part of my disappearance these days. It also has nothing to do with you. Inside my own body, I am disappearing, even to myself, and it's happening faster and faster. It's not like shrinking. It's more like fading. From some special effects my brain has contrived, and to stay here now requires a massive gathering of resources, executive monitoring, systemic adjustments, guru-like self-awareness, self-efficacy to avoid shutdown, shame. I'm disappearing. I know it in all five senses, each and every moment, even in my sleep. My disappearance is an entirely physical phenomenon, which makes it more real, less unbelievable, less undeniable. It's a little like a battery dying, and no charger will restore its power. The battery looks the same, 
but it isn't. The failure of this simile is this. The battery does not work like hell to rally the energy left it to deliver its full capacity to serve its intended purpose, the one for which it was manufactured. A battery does not bust its ass to compensate, to show up anyway, to rally a system-wide emergency intervention, all-out disaster relief effort. Okay, I, I'm exaggerating a little. It's the nature of degenerative drama. But I'm not lying. This is how it feels. This is how it feels. A little more each day. Well, I sometimes make the distinction between outer space and inner space. Outer space is not necessarily the cosmos out there among or beyond the planets. Outer space is anything other than myself the world in which I move or observe. Inner space is that which is within me and all that can entail. So this is a poem about inner space. Number one, I wasn't taught about inner space. My mother told me to stay away from there because that's the place. Sinful impulses lurk, nasty demons, dangerous instincts pace, monstrous in dungeon cells where God intended them to die. She said if we weren't vigilant, disciplined, well, we'd be overwhelmed by the evil within, commit hellacious, unforgivable crimes. So my inner space should be avoided. I should stay busy, occupied, distracted, get good grades, stay the hell away from my own interior, get a job, obey my elders, my boss. As a result, I was always a lost soul, doomed to search outside myself for meaning, purpose, and joy. I had no clue how to develop an inner life. Two. Well, then came jazz. <laughs> it was the early 90s. Already in my 40s, I studied Miles Davis for a class I was teaching. It was all intellectual at first, like all my theological training. I was preparing lectures, lesson plans, when something strange, wonderful happened. All the lights inside came on. It was breathtakingly beautiful in there. I started with Miles' first great quintet, then the second by the time I reached in a silent way and Bitches Brew, finally Tutu, attended one of his last conference concerts. My inner space was wide open. Well, I was listening to Coltrane, Sun Ra, Albert Eiler, Free Jazz Chicago, Free Jazz NYC, and then the poetry began like sunburst, surging, rising, streaming, new cosmic spaces, constellations, galaxies inside me, inside my inner space. My interior was not some medieval hell, but my first glimpse of infinite possibilities, bliss, grace, the fullness of being was inside me all along. Oh, it was more beautiful than the wisdom teachers, saints, sadhus, poets, dancers, saxophonists, their percussion sections. <laughs> Ever recorded. I filled in huge binders and notebooks with magmaphonic poems, metaphoric noise, charge 
it's for word jams. <laughs> I haven't yet learned how to stay inside, you know? Stay inside. I still panic, freak out. Run, run, run away, run, 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 run away. Because, well, my original training was thorough, strong. But now, now I practice every day, at least two hours, drop deeper, deeper down into my own interior, that deep, wide, vast inner space, always hoping I'll stay forever, this time awake, awake, awake. Sometimes I think being locked in, if you will, the stay-at-home policy practice of the pandemic isn't all that different from the way I felt sometimes having Parkinson's disease being locked in. Do you know what I mean? I'll bet you do. A sense of being somehow disconnected from my place in the world, disconnected from the surroundings, the people in my life, and the activities that are important to me. Well, one of the things I've been experimenting with all along, since I was first diagnosed in 2005, and especially during the pandemic, is sort of how to travel when you can't go anywhere. I recently wrote this little poem for, for my grandson. I wrote a longer version for myself on the same topic. Um, but after I was done, I wanted to try to break it down for him in a way that he might understand it. He's still very young. So the title of this poem is, What to do when you wish you could see someone you love or go somewhere you want, but you can't because of the pandemic. I imagine, I say, let's go for a walk, Jamin. I imagine you nod. I imagine we grab our nuggets caps. The elevator goes down fast. We cross the courtyard and go through the tall gate. The sidewalk is skinny, but we hold hands. At the corner, we look both ways. We cross to the park. You run in the grass looking for sticks and stones. I smile when you show me one of your treasures. Let's swing, Grandpa. I say, one, two, three, go. We run, but you run faster. You swing so high, you touch the sky. I shout, hooray, like you just scored in the NBA finals. You laugh and laugh, I laugh and laugh. <laughs> and you stop pumping and jump down from the swing. I clap, you take a bow, hand in hand, we walk around the park. When we pass the row of tall pine trees, they whisper, hey, that's the boy who swings so high, and that's his grandpa too. We stop and Take a bow. The trees keep whispering about us. We walk quietly. Our hands squeeze each other. I imagine we get home and you tell Grandma, I went so high in the swing, and she laughs as if she could see you. We keep our nuggets caps on. We get a drink and sit down to watch basketball on YouTube. I imagine we cheer.
that one makes me smile. I haven't been able to walk or with or hug my grandson now for many weeks. Reading that poem aloud helps me feel a little of what it will be like when we get to do it again. Walking has always been an important part of my life. As a matter of fact, I was first diagnosed because I was having problems walking. That led directly to my diagnosis. I went on another imaginary walk recently. This one is called A Walk With My Sister. I want to go for a walk beside my sister today in the space she calls sacred. Claims even the hawks speak directly to her, and she understands the old trees, their winter sign language, summer whispers. The coyotes make sure they cross her path, and the magpies spread their gossip to everyone. Sister learns the ancient roots of each story. My sister talks to the wetlands where the spirits rise each morning, hung over from dancing all night on the lake. She tells them her secrets, her dreams. She shares her deepest desires, fears. The spirits follow a while until her mind cools, clears. The waters reveal their mysteries. She walks on toward the woods, each step, each breath releases weariness. My sister can actually explain better than any theology professor, evangelical enthusiast, why this particular space is sacred and how she knows like baby ducks where to find her mama. When I walk with her, I cannot help experiencing the same holiness. So there's two excursions into inner space, I would say. I imagined my walk with my grandson. I imagined my walk with my sister. The walks I imagined were not created out of whole cloth, pure fantasy. They drew on experiences I'd had in the past and my desire, my longing for them now, in the future, the near future, please. So this business of exploring inner space is also a vital aspect of metaphor medicine. It's a way to go out when you can't. But it's not always pleasant in there. This is a poem called Grief Space. It's a pandemic poem. I cannot stand upright Inside this tiny concavity squeezed me. The walls decay God's time, not the rhythms of weeping. Then echoes, laughing, wonder, always before now. Near me, it is not dark, but light weighs too much to be effortless. Ripples in slate. The rattle of glass prayers along fissures. Beads of blood, each a little splash. Unheard, me, dystonic, a sculpted tremor, chunk knots. 
Nowhere to fall, my inner scaffold leans. Someone's ragged breathing stops. A body shudders. Me. A throat <clears throat> clears. Weakly. Um, one wavering tone, another vibrance, lifting the first, another lifting that, mingling less wobbly me. These stony curvatures, these resonant Exhalations. Here's another possibility for moving in, through, around inner space. Meditation, or a very long journey in a very short poem. I imagine I'm sitting on a Huck Finn raft, floating down a wide, slow-moving river, dumping my thoughts one by one overboard, floating, empty desires bobbing in my wake, rafting seaward, until finally... I'm deposited in my living room, seated before a six-inch chunk of wrought iron Buddha. Almost immediately, the Tibetan bowl app on my phone sings, I'm finished. Ah. The final poem I want to share with you this time is one called, I'm Back. I don't know where I've been. No idea how I got back. I'm here. I don't remember leaving. I made no preparations, had no itinerary, no passport, no luggage, well, maybe a backpack. I slipped away, unnoticed, left a stranger in charge. He was available, I guess, and I wasn't. I have no clue where he came from, nor where he's gone since my return. Anyway, I'm back. I don't have any photos, no entertainment stories, no tourist curios from my absence. I might have been in rehab, hmm. on retreat. Perhaps I was kidnapped by alien forces and given some treatment to erase my memories like shock therapy or, or something. I don't know. I just woke up this morning and here I was again. Here I was again. I, I can't explain it but I like it. I'm glad to be back home a while this time. And I brought this poem. Well, I hope you've enjoyed these poems, that you've heard something that touches you, moves you, challenges you, something you can identify with, something you're curious about, something in you stirred, maybe awakened. And I want to encourage you to look at the prompts I've left, an invitation to you to write your own poem or poems with some tips on how to do that. And we'll meet in the small group on Zoom 
soon and share your work and talk more about this business of metaphor medicine. See you then.